Hello, everybody. Uh, today we have a great show, and I am very excited to welcome to the show the mayor of the largest city in the United States of America, Bill de Blasio of New York City. Bill, thank you so much for being with us. Bernie, what a joy to be with you. And it's a much warmer environment than when we were together last on my inauguration yes. day outdoors. Uh, so thank you so much for having me. Bill was very, very kind to invite me to give him the oath of office. Yes. And it was freezing, uh, but we managed to survive. <laughs> we're still here. <laughs> <laughs> and we're excited about your second term. All right, Bill, there's a whole lot to discuss. Yeah. Um, let me begin it off. Uh, by say, asking you, uh, what does it mean in the year 2018, and you're beginning your second term now, mm -hmm. to be a progressive mayor uh, in an era of Donald Trump? What does that mean? Ironically, it means there's a world of possibilities. And uh, I think the election of Donald Trump was not the essence of what happened in 2015 and 2016. I think what was happening already since the Occupy Wall Street movement and, and manifesting all over the country locally, including in places like New York City, and culminated in your campaign was an obvious movement for progressive change. I fundamentally believe we're entering a new progressive era. I can certainly say that about New York City. Something very big is happening in New York City in terms of fast, big progressive changes that I think are going to be the norm going forward and, and real different politics. So I would just say, look, uh, despite Donald Trump, the energy levels, the organization levels, the number of people getting involved, a lot of it started where your campaign has, has deepened like we saw in the Women's March this last weekend. I believe Trump is not somebody that we should see as, you know, sort of a door closer. I think he inadvertently is opening a new door. Okay, let's just jump in. I've got about a million questions yeah. here. We've got a limited amount of time. I worry, and I know you worry, yeah. uh, that democracy itself, the ability of people to bring about change, to participate in the political process, yep. is now undergoing a real threat. Correct. All right? You're the mayor of the largest city. Uh, in the country, what are you doing in New York City to revitalize uh, democracy, to bring people together, to have a campaign finance system so that billionaires, and I guess in New York City have a little bit of experience about billionaires yeah. buying elections. Yes. Right, what are you doing to lead the country to make sure that we have a vibrant democracy? Here's something good I can say about New York City. My predecessor was the richest man in the city. Uh, I'm someone who doesn't have a lot of money. The only way I got elected is because we have a progressive campaign finance system and one that survived the reality of Citizens United because local laws still matter. And we have strict campaign spending limits, strict donation limits, and matching funds that allow even right. candidates like me to get to an office right. like this. What does that mean exactly? You know, Mary Smith wants to run yep. the mayor. All right, how can she run if she doesn't have a lot of money? Mary Smith can raise a lot of grassroots contributions. And they get matched six to one, which is a powerful magnifier. So I'll give you an example. Our system allows you to raise up to $175 from a New York City resident, get it matched six to one. That relatively modest donor suddenly just gave $1,000, okay. right? If you give $10, it gets matched six to one. And that encourages everyday people to get involved. To your point, that encourages democracy. That encourages involvement. And I could never have gotten uh, elected uh, because the establishment forces in New York City were never going to support me, but I got those smaller donations, and it also comes with a reason that people get invested and involved, just like we saw so amazingly on your campaign. People giving a little bit of money also gets them involved. All right, and that withstood legal challenges Absolutely. from the Citizens United decision. It has. All right, so your message is that other cities around America could do the same thing. Do it yourself. Okay. Take matters into your own hands and create the local change. And I'll say one other thing, because we're talking about how to reinvigorate democracy. Uh, every victory reinvigorates democracy. So, for example, when I came into office, uh, we had a big fight in the city to get rid of the broken policy of stop and frisk that was harming the relationship between police and community. We got rid of it. We got safer. We had a big fight to achieve paid sick leave for another half million New Yorkers. That fight, that grassroots fight won the day. That gets people involved. Right. Okay. Let me jump into some of the sure. big issues. Uh, you have been active in early childhood education. Yes. Education in general, you know, I know, uh, that people are not going to have decent paying jobs unless they have a quality education, often a higher education. Talk about New York City and education. Number one, there's literally the number one 
uh, item on my agenda when I ran. I said we're going to have pre-K for all our kids, full day, high quality pre-K, for free. And that meant that tens of thousands of families would also have a huge economic burden lifted. Working class people, middle class people, who in New York City, you, you could pay over $1,000 a month for pre-K easily. We literally took that burden off. I walked in the door, about 20,000 kids in New York City were getting full day pre-K. Now it's almost 70,000. It is a universal right. We added a whole nother grade to our school system. We saw what was possible. And Bernie, I think this is part of what I feel deeply big changes are happening in New York City. Something very different is happening, which in energizes me to tell other people, we did it, you can do it, aim high. So now we're going for the three-year-old level. Our stated policy is by the end of this term, every three-year-old in New York City gets early childhood education for free. For free? For free. Okay. Congratulations. That is, this is a crisis that we don't talk about here in Washington very much. You know, I know that kids who do not have quality early childhood education are not going to do well in school. They're going to drop out. They're not going to get the jobs we need. So congratulations for being a leader uh, on that effort. Uh, let me talk about an issue certainly uh, applicable to New York City. It's applicable to almost every major city in America, and that is the issue of affordable housing. Yes. All right. Uh, somebody, what are the rents in New York City right oh, now? Oh, God. It's crazy now. I mean, uh, you know, a working family can be facing $2,000 or more uh, a month in rent easily in, the place, in many, many parts of New York City. It could be much more, too. I mean, it's, and you know, this is the, the double-edged sword of gentrification. And uh, as the city got safer, and it's true in other cities, now suddenly everyone wants to live there, and the prices get out of reach for working people. And if government doesn't intervene, this is, I think you and I both share a very stringent view of the problems of the free enterprise system. Uh, this is one where the free enterprise system marginalizes people and forces them out of their own neighborhood. Only way to stop that is through serious government intervention. All right. Talk about it. All right. I know this is a problem in San Francisco. It's oh, my God. It's a problem God. in Birmingham, Alabama. It's a problem all over this country. All right. What can you do? What are you doing in New York City to address it? And look, I, I feel for San Francisco because they're, you know, I, I remember the old San Francisco, and today San Francisco is not a place for working people, and that's not acceptable to me. We've said New York City must remain a place for working people. If we are not uh, economically diverse, we're no longer New York City. Our entire spirit, you know it well, having grown up in Brooklyn. I grew up in a rent-controlled apartment in Brooklyn, yes. And what a difference it meant for your yes, family. That's right. So today in New York City, we still have rent controls of different types, and they reach over 2 million people. 2 million people are living in rent control. Rent stabilization and rent control. And that's a huge difference maker. And we, in, in my government, we said we're going to make sure that if the... Uh, time of year comes to assess whether there should be a rent increase. We're going to have a fair estimation that respects tenants as well as landlords. Guess what? We ended up with two years of a rent freeze. Two years where by government decision, we said the landlords actually did not have a reason for a rent increase and the people deserved a rent freeze. We did that. Never been done before. This is an example of something that would have been probably the conventional wisdom would have said five, ten years ago, that's impossible. We did it and we proved it was possible. What is this gentrification stuff is very difficult. Yeah. Very difficult. What do you see the long-term solution to making cities livable for working people, not forcing people out of communities that they grew up in, that they love, where they want to live? How do you address that issue? Look, wherever possible, to put these same kind of standards in place that New York and a few other places have, there should be some form of rent regulation everywhere in urban America, given what we're dealing with today. There should be, another thing we do, free lawyers to stop illegal evictions. You pro Say a word on that one. The city of New York now, and our city council with great leadership on this, will provide a lawyer for free to any New Yorker who makes 50000 or less, they get the full legal service for free. If they make more than 50000 they still have access to legal advice. But the idea is to stop illegal evictions, stop harassment by landlords, which is being exacerbated by the ever-growing cost. The, the greed of some landlords, I want to be fair, not all. There are plenty of decent landlords, too. But the greed of some is such that they will stoop to the most illegal and unscrupulous things to get tenants out and jack up the rent for someone new. We're now fighting back by giving publicly funded legal help to stop that. That's a difference. That You can do that anywhere. You can, with the legal aid uh, lawyers around the country, you can do city that. City attorneys? They're, no, it's legal aid, legal services, and we fund it. And it makes a huge difference. That's one thing. One other thing I'd mention is we passed a law. We're very proud of it. 
that requires the creation of affordable housing in major new developments. So, for example, if a developer comes along, and you remember this from your days as mayor of Burlington, uh, developers come along with all sorts of schemes, but they realize they can't get anything done if the city doesn't approve. We now have a law that says if you want the approval, you have to provide affordable housing, and we've got stipulated amounts. It's at minimum 20, but in most cases 25 or 30 percent of the apartments have to be affordable, or else you cannot get a permit to build. That's a game changer, too. And in a lot of cities, you could be doing that now because the values and the desire of people to be in the city is growing all the time. Why not use the power of the public sector to fight back and bargain hard, you know, know, strike a harder bargain because developer for too long in too many cities just got what they want? All right. Let me change gear. Uh, An issue that you campaigned on, it's an issue reverberating all over this country. Uh, twofold. Number one, we want to keep our citizens safe. Yep. We want to do it in a way that we go forward preventing crime. We want reform in a broken criminal justice system. What are you doing in New York City? Bernie, this is another area where something very big and something very different is happening in New York City because I, I always say we didn't start the mass incarceration crisis, but we will end it in New York City. We have consistently reduced our jail population. Uh, our jail system now has under 9,000 inmates. It used to be over 20,000 just two decades ago, and we're driving it down steadily. Because is that true of the state as well or just of the state? I don't know about the whole rest of the state, but I can tell you one thing the NYPD is doing that's crucial to this. We realized that arrests were being overused in the previous approach the, before I came into office with my police commissioners. We've reduced arrests. This is an amazing figure. In the last four years... 2017 compared to 2013, 100,000 fewer arrests. 100,000 fewer arrests at the same time consistently safer. We're the safest big city in America. The level of crime in New York City right now, major crime, is consistent with the 1950s. The number of homicides, you'd have to go back to when the Brooklyn Dodgers were playing at Ebbets Field That's in 1951. I know, I know, I got controversial there, okay. right? But literally, the, we've had the lowest number of homicides since right, 1951. Explain that. Explain that. <coughs> <coughs> Here's All the right, d- so you have fewer arrests, yep. lower crime. Now, there are a lot of factors. Of course. All right, because this is not just happening in New York City. It's happening around the country as well. What, what's your understanding? What's your analysis? My analysis is that the policies that created a rift between police and community were not only counterproductive in terms of respecting people and uh, trying to create communication, which they made impossible, things like the overuse of stop and frisk, overuse of arrest, We're creating a wedge between police and community. They're very disrespectful in particular to young men of color, and we're denigrating to young men of color. By ending those policies, we opened up communication, mutual respect, actual desire to have a constant dialogue between police and community. All right. This is – we did that when I was mayor as well. We introduced community policing. This is – all right. A difficult issue. Yeah. Easier to talk about than to see take place out on the streets in reality. What does it mean out on the streets? Now, I know, because I've been traveling, you know, I've traveled all over the country. It amazed me to the degree, especially uh, among people of color, the degree to which they saw police not as somebody who could help them, but as somebody to be feared. What a terrible thing. What a terrible thing. And obviously, that's exactly what you want to prevent. You want to see police departments and communities working together. How are you doing that out on in reality. What you said is so powerful, Bernie, because one day an officer said to me just spontaneously, he said that more and more people are now coming up to him. And I said, why do you think? And he literally said spontaneously, he said, people will talk to you if they're not afraid of you. And um, I think it is about a neighborhood policing philosophy that encourages dialogue. Literally, our officers are giving community residents their personal cell phone and email number so that they can really? address, so they can get to them directly. And what I'm hearing from our officers who are part of the neighborhood policing initiative is, that folks are reaching out to them with the kind of information they always wished as officers they'd had. They know where the drug deals are taking Of course. Every community of every background all over the world, you know, there are community residents who can tell you the real deal, right? This is as old as time itself. There are village elders in rural communities all over the world and in neighborhoods all over the cities of America. There are people looking out the window seeing what's really going on or who can tell an officer who's involved with drugs, where there's an illegal weapon, where there's a gang problem brewing. Our officers are getting that flow of information now. 
and it's making a huge difference. And, and here's what I hear from the officers. They're getting a lot more thank yous from community members because the community members now feel that's their officer. That officer is there for them. It's making a is big difference. Really, are you seeing a change in mentality among the officers themselves? Yeah, and we have part I mean, of Let's be clear. Let's back this up. You know, I know, being a cop is not an easy job. It's very tough. And by the way, all of society's ills, including the mental health challenges that never got addressed, were put on our officers to somehow address. That was very unfair to begin with. And we got to go to the root causes of those problems. But here's why I do hear from the officers consistently. They're not being told... Go make quotas, you know, go arrest a bunch of people, go stop and frisk a bunch of people. They're being told build relationships, get to know people. Uh, it is much more gratifying for our officers. Right. They're getting the gratitude they deserve. But I'll also tell you, some of this was retraining. We retrained the entire police force in how to de-escalate conflict. We are now going to retrain the entire force in implicit bias and how to weed out the biases that every single one of us as a human being have. Now, you mentioned something to me see if my memory is right on this when I was in New York City. You said something interesting. Uh, all across this country and what Black Lives Matter and other organizations are about is the use of lethal force when it should not be used. I mean, we've seen, God knows, too many examples of this. You mentioned to me that the number of times a weapon is discharged in New York City now is significantly Correct. less than it used to be. Very in other so. words, there is now, I presume, an effort to use lethal force, which visibly sometimes has to be used, but as little as possible. Yes. Say a word about that. So here's a, here's a context for you. Eight and a half million people now live in New York City. Uh, we have 36,000 police officers, and there are 365 days in a year. Uh, under 100 times uh, in 2016, any of our officers discharge their weapon and a number of those times were either something that was accidental or dealing with uh, a threatening pit bull or something like that. Uh, only a few dozen times was it actually in the line of duty in a conflict situation. Look at the sheer enormity of the situation we're talking about, the city of that size, all those officers, so many days. The restraint levels that our officers are showing are absolutely extraordinary. Their training is telling them to show that restraint, and they're doing a great job with it. So this is another part of how we end these tragedies, uh, is helping our officers. You know, our officers didn't used to get this kind of training. Think about this. Airline pilots, lawyers, doctors got retrained all the time. Police officers in New York City only got to go to the firing range and work on their marksmanship until under first Commissioner Bratton, now Commissioner O'Neill, they get retrained regularly in how to work on these tactics to reduce the escalation of conflict. And to use lethal force only when absolutely Only necessary. when necessary. Yeah. All right, let me touch on uh, a few other issues. Uh, climate change, environmental degradation, it's not a New York City issue, it's a global issue. Correct. You're the largest city uh, in the state, you've got a lot of resources, what are you doing about climate change uh, and protecting the environment? I remember I was in the South Bronx a couple of years ago, yeah. and I was told that just, I think it was one out of four children was dealing with asthma. Yep. Does that sound right? Uh, it's correct? a very high number. And um, All right. What are you guys doing about, what role can you play in taking on the fossil fuel industry? I, I'll say this for New York City. We just acted, and I want to urge every city, every county, every state to do the same. Divest divest from the fossil fuel industry. Let's help bring the death knell to this industry. It's done so much harm. Uh, like the tobacco companies that were successfully sued uh, decades ago, we're also suing five of the biggest, including ExxonMobil, for example, uh, who systematically poisoned the earth, knew about it, covered it up, explained it away, tried to hook people more and more on their product. Uh, we think that what every city can do, and every locality, use your litigation power uh, to go at these bad actors and get the resources back. We're looking for billions to make up for what they've done to us. The cost of Sandy, Hurricane Sandy alone in New York City was over $19 billion. And we're having to pay billions and billions more each year for resiliency. But the other thing is by divesting, let's prove that there's an economically unviable industry. This is an industry that its assets should stay in the ground 
and there, it's not the industry of the future. All right, so by divesting, what does that mean? New York City funds are no longer being invested in fossil fuel industry. In the next five years, because it'll take a wind down, $5 billion in New York City pension funds will be removed from fossil fuel companies. And we have set a specific deadline, we have a dollar goal, and we've said, we're doing this, we'll find other good investments, we want to protect our retirees for sure but not at the cost of investing in something that's poisoning the earth. And, and let's use our economic power. I think this is one of the most important points. At the grassroots, there's a lot of economic power. Are, are the League of Cities and Towns and the Conference of Mayors addressing this issue as well? There's a tremendous focus, I think, getting each locality to do the more radical things they can do, like divestment, like litigation against the oil companies, that's going to take a grassroots movement. There's been an incredible movement in New York City. I want to give them credit because I have to tell you, when I first raised it to experts in my administration, they raised all sorts of problems, roadblocks, challenges. But that movement kept pushing us and saying divestment would make a huge difference. And we need that grassroots movement to get other places to do it as well. Is New York City becoming more sustainable? Are you investing in sustainable energy in uh, non-fossil fuel transportation? Absolutely. For example, you know, we... Right now in our city, we've set a goal of 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. But then when Trump pulled out of the Paris Agreement, we said we have to go even farther. We have a very a vigorous mandate on the buildings in our city, which is actually where most of the pollution comes from in New York City, that they have to reduce their emissions, they have to put in conservation, or we will find them. Real fines, fines that could be as high as a million dollars right. per building. Conservation means weatherization. It's weatherization and changing and updating equipment and all sorts of things, putting in the right monitors so they use less energy. We're going to an all-electric city a car fleet. We're putting up uh, electric charging stations for electric vehicles all over the five boroughs. These are things that uh, help move the whole situation because they also tell people, for example, you want an electric car, it's not so easy to have one in a place like New York City right now. We want to show people this is going to be a, a much better option going forward because those stations will be around for you. Okay. Um, you are an advocate of single payer. Yes. What role can the largest city in the country play in the fight for health care for all? Well, first, by supporting what you've done with Medicare for All, and I really want to thank you for that because, you know, everything you did in your campaign changed the politics of America. And I've said this to you, I've, you know, I'm from the bottom of my heart, the American political process will never be the same because of what you created. And that means not only that people at the grassroots now understand their power and that you can approach a political campaign for elective office differently. It also means you can approach each and every issue along the way differently, same organizing approach. So for us in New York City, uh, we want to use our political power, our consumer power, et cetera, to fight for a single-payer system. Uh, look, we're trying to get this done at the state level. It's hard to do locally, but you can do it at the state level. We play a big, we have a big presence in the state of New York, so we're going to fight for that change. We need to make some political change. As you know, unfortunately, New York still has a Republican state Senate. We need to change that this year, and that would open the door to single-payer legislation having a real shot in our state capitol. But I, I think it's the same basic principle, organizing at the grassroots for change. I think what Medicare for All now means to people is also very different since the fight to save the Affordable Care Act. You see the attitudes of the American people changing rapidly now on health care. Right. And what you put forward is making more and more sense to more and more people. Okay. Let me go to a more political question, a really interesting question. You have a city which has people, I suspect, from every country on earth. Literally. you got zillions of languages and everything else. Amazing uh, diversity. You're the mayor of this city. Unlike the president of the United States, you want to bring people together and not divide them up. How do you do that in a city of such complexity and diversity? By telling people they matter. You know, one of the most powerful things the last few years has been the Black Lives Matter movement. The phrase, I think, open minds, rightfully. If the society and the government communicate to people they matter, a lot of other things can be possible. If you denigrate people, if you devalue them, which has been too much of the history of our country, then it is understandable that there'll be not only division, there'll be hopelessness. So our message constantly is uh, that all the communities of the city matter. 
by making things universal, very consistent with everything that you've fought through. For example, giving people pre-K for all says you matter. We're investing in you, regardless of your background, regardless of what language you speak. We protect immigrants of all backgrounds. We... I'd say a word on that, because obviously, right yeah. now, we're in a terrible, terrible struggle right here in Washington on immigration reform, on protecting 800,000 young dreamers. What are you doing in New York on that? The message we give in New York City is that we're going to respect everyone regardless of documentation status. And in New York City, that means half a million people, Bernie. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Think about it. In the country, almost 12 million undocumented folks, who I always remind people, are essential to the American economy. You could debate how they got here and what happened before, but right now there's 12 million people who are part of making this economy work and are in each and every community in America, including a lot of rural communities, essential to the rural economy. Agriculture, big time. Absolutely. Right. And why don't we, why don't we f push back on the divisive forces by talking about what's really happening on the ground? So in New York City, half a million New Yorkers, they're New Yorkers. I don't care in the first instance about their documentation status. They're my fellow New Yorkers. We tell them that we're not going to ask them their documentation status. Our police will not ask and have not for decades. In the schools, in the public hospitals, no one's ever going to ask you documentation status. We want to give you as much opportunity to live a good life as anyone else. God forbid there's an effort to deport someone. We now, working with our city council, have legal services available to assist families in fighting deportation because you know what happens a lot of time? The breadwinner in the family gets deported and the kids get left behind, which is the most unfair and also uh, t you know, stupid for the society, the stupid possibility in a world that you would break up a family and leave the kids behind to have to fend for themselves. So we help in that way. And one thing I'm also very proud of, we have an ID card, which has become a very positive thing, IDNYC. And it says, you know, a lot of folks are undocumented. They can't, they can't get a lease. They can't get a bank account. They can't visit a hospital, someone, a loved one in the hospital. They can't visit their kid's school without an ID. We create a New York City-only ID, IDNYC, you're not asked your documentation status. You get the ID card. It opens up a world of possibilities. But for a lot of immigrants, documented and undocumented, they've said they feel they belong, that they're being respected and valued because they have the same ID card everyone else has. All right, Bill, we want to wind this uh, down. What didn't I ask you? Well, one thing I want to mention is what we did just in the last few days. We are taking on the opioid manufacturers because, Bernie, you – look – I, I want to just commend you. I've said to your town hall meeting in West Virginia was one of the most powerful things I've seen in a long time about actually reaching working people and changing the dialogue. And that's where there's so much hope for progressives. When we talk about working people's needs, everything can be different. West Virginia has been ravaged by the opioid crisis, as has the Bronx, as has Staten Island as and has other parts. Vermont, as has Kentucky, as has communities throughout this country. 60,000 people died last year of overdoses. So it's an unacceptable status quo. So we are suing the big opioid makers and distributors. And we're saying, again, very much like the tobacco lawsuit from the past, they purposefully created this crisis for profit. They need to pay so we can start to reclaim people's lives. Excellent. Um, that is an issue that, you know, here in Congress, what we're talking about is providing money for states and cities, and that's important. But at the end of the day, you have people who likely knew exactly the addictive capabilities of these opioids and allowed them to go out. And in fact, is, encouraged. And that is outrageous. They've got to be held accountable. So I'm glad that you're working on that. All right. Um, I think what we heard from Mayor Bill de Blasio is that in the era of Trump, we don't sit and moan and groan. We use the resources that we have to fight back, to create the kind of vibrant democracy this country needs, to address the significant problems that we have. And we can do it. We can do it when we stand together. So, Bill, I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank you for the great work you're doing. My regards to the family. We'll see you soon. Thank you so much, Bernie. See you soon.